Back in 2014, a headline caught my eye. The Nobel Prize in Physics awarded for the blue LED. As an engineer who had hands-on experience with LEDs in the lab, the idea of blue LEDs being special never crossed my mind. I had seen plenty of red and green ones, but blue? Well, they seemed rare and intriguing, but the question was, why a Nobel Prize for blue ones? Immersed in full-time work, professional commitments kept me from exploring this question, but it always stayed in the back of my mind. Fast forward to 2024. Here we are. Today, we'll uncover what made the blue LEDs so noble-worthy. Before delving into the reasons behind the Nobel Prize, let's understand some of the fundamentals, starting with what is an LED. In some semiconductor materials, when electrons transition from the conduction band to the valence band, they release photons. Simply put, they emit light. This fundamental principle forms the basis of LED functionality. LED stands for light emitting diode. Now as it's a diode, you will have an N region with surplus electrons and a P region with excess holes. All you need to do is apply a forward bias voltage. Due to this, recombination of electrons and holes takes place within this structure, which leads to the emission of light. The visible spectrum encompasses a range of colors. Red is at the low frequency long wavelength end and violet is at the high frequency short wavelength end. The frequency of light increases as we move towards the violet end. Thus, the band gap energy required to produce that particular frequency or color also increases as we move towards the violet end. As you can see in the chart, Standard materials like silicon and germanium are not considered for LEDs as they do not emit light. Instead, special type of semiconductor materials are employed for the visible spectrum. And the challenge intensifies when it comes to blue light. Why, you may ask? Because of the high frequency or the high band gap energy. Now, due to higher band gap energy, blue light can be produced in some type of exotic materials only. So which materials were considered? Zinc selenide and gallium nitride were the two contenders. While gallium nitride initially seemed promising for creating blue light, practical challenges proved daunting, leading even big names like Bell Labs and Philips to give up on it. It was difficult to produce high-quality crystals of gallium nitride. But that wasn't the case with zinc selenide. It was easier to get high-quality crystals of zinc selenide. On the popularity scale, zinc selenide outshone gallium nitride. This contrast becomes evident when looking at the attendance of researchers in a conference on physics during mid-90s. During this conference, which was held in Japan, zinc selenide sessions attracted a significant number of participants, around 500, while gallium nitride struggled with minimal attendance, just five folks. Researchers recognizing the challenges associated with gallium nitride discouraged it and wanted everyone to shift their focus towards zinc selenide. It was also very difficult to get P-type layer using gallium nitride. But why are we talking about this? Why does the choice of the material matter? Well, because all three Nobel Prize winners did focus on the popular zinc selenide, but on the not-so-popular gallium nitride. Their reasons were different and interesting. Akasaki, drawing from his past experience, believed in gallium nitride's potential and continued to work on it with Amano, his PhD student at Nagoya University. Shuji Nakamura also chose gallium nitride, but for a slightly different reason. He wanted a PhD degree. In Japan, one could get something known as a paper PhD by publishing five papers without attending any university. As zinc selenide was already gaining popularity amongst researchers, with numerous papers getting published on it, 
Nakamura chose the not so popular gallium nitride as his topic for research papers. Thus, his initial goal was not to invent the blue LED, which he ultimately did, but rather to obtain a PhD degree. In 1986, a breakthrough unfolded as Akasaki and Amano successfully created a high quality gallium nitride crystal. They used aluminium nitride buffer layer for growth of superior quality of gallium nitride on top of it. So, there was a substrate layer of sapphire, a buffer layer of aluminium nitride, and finally gallium nitride on top of it. This success came from a series of experiments and careful observations. In 1989, they succeeded in creating a P type layer as well. By coincidence, Akasaki and Amano stumbled upon an unexpected benefit. Their P type layer exhibited a more intense glow under a scanning electron microscope, which means the electron beam from the microscope inadvertently enhanced the efficiency of the P type layer. This was another big breakthrough. Ultimately, in 1992, they presented their first diode emitting a brilliant blue light. Now let's see what Shoji Nakamura was up to during the same time. It was 1989. He was working with Nichia Chemical Corporation, a small chemical company in Japan. While Akasaki and Amano had developed a research scale reactor for producing gallium nitride on a small scale, Nakamura, working in a commercial setting, faced a different kind of challenge. He needed a way to cultivate high quality gallium nitride. On a large scale. There was an additional complication. Remember the aluminium nitride buffer layer? Now, the use of this layer requires a high concentration of aluminium in the reactor. This leads to issues with reproducibility for subsequent gallium nitride growth. Hence, it was important to find a way to get rid of aluminium. Thanks to the founder of Nichia, Nakamura acquired a commercially available reactor worth 2 million US dollars. Now, this newly acquired reactor wasn't originally made to grow gallium nitride. Thus, it needed modifications. Nakamura spent his mornings tweaking the reactor and his afternoons growing and analyzing the layers. This routine persisted for 1.5 years. In 1990, the persistence paid off. Nakamura came up with his own novel reactor capable of producing the highest quality gallium nitride and that too without using aluminium. He replaced the aluminium nitride buffer layer with a superior quality gallium nitride buffer layer. Thus, using this novel reactor, it was now possible to grow gallium nitride on larger substrates suitable for commercialization. So now it was possible to get high quality gallium nitride. But what about the P type layer? Why was this layer becoming electrically inert? Here's the reason. In the growth of gallium nitride, they used ammonia as the source of nitrogen. When ammonia does its thing, it introduces atomic hydrogen in the gallium nitride crystal. This hydrogen then combines with the magnesium. In the P type layer, forming an MGH complex. And this stops magnesium from acting as an acceptor in the P type layer. Now, all of this sounds so logical, right? But this hydrogen mystery, which made the P type layer electrically inert, baffled the researchers for 20 years until Nakamura cracked it in 1992. Now, do you know why Akasaki and Amano's Electron beam trick worked in activating the P type layer? Here's the thing the electron beam in Akasaki and Amano's setup caused heating in the target area. This heated the MGH complex, causing hydrogen to be released and allowing the affected Mg atoms to act as acceptors. Now, Nakamura did not just solve the mystery associated with the P type layer, but he also suggested a brilliant solution. Better than the electron beam one to activate it. And that is heating the material at a very high temperature. 
This is also known as thermal annealing. It is simpler, cheaper and can be applied to multiple substrates making it suitable for large scale production. Ultimately, in 1993, they stepped up the LED game by adding an indium gallium nitride layer known as the active layer. Why, you may ask? Well, a pure gallium nitride PN homojunction LED structure was just too inefficient. It wouldn't have given us the high efficiency LED we have today. As you can see in the energy band diagram, the recombination rate of electrons and holes is quite low in this case. So, this kind of PN homojunction LED structure isn't very efficient when it comes to emission of light. That's why they used a double heterostructure LED design. And in this case, the active layer is sandwiched between the P and N type layer. Now, by tossing in some indium into the gallium nitride crystal, the electrical band gap shrinks. As you can see in the energy band diagram, this not only allows confinement of electrons and holes, making recombination more efficient, but also lets you play with the light's color by tweaking the amount of indium in indium gallium nitride alloy. If you add less amount of indium, you'll end up with violet color. If you add a little bit more, you will get blue. And if you add even more, you'll end up with green color. So that's how we got our first commercial blue LED in the early 1990s. Now you might be still wondering, why a Nobel Prize? Well, it's all about completing the RGB spectrum. We had red and green diodes for ages, but without blue, there was no white light. So one way of creating white light is to mix all three of them. Another more common way is to use a blue LED and cover it with a coating of phosphor. The phosphor converts some blue into yellow and a combination of these two colors results in white light. This white light finds applications in various fields, with its most significant impact seen in lighting. Lighting alone constitutes 20 to 30 percent of our electrical energy consumption. White LED lamps with their high efficiency outperform fluorescent and incandescent lights because LEDs last up to 100,000 hours compared to just 10,000 for fluorescent and a mere 1,000 for incandescent lights. In areas without electricity grids, a low power LED lamp can run efficiently with a cheap solar panel. In the face of global warming related concerns, we are always seeking sustainable options. And what could be better than this? Low power, high efficiency, low CO2 emissions, and a cost-effective solution. According to the Nobel Prize website, this Nobel Prize is awarded for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy-saving white light sources. Now, do you know why was I so eager to share this story with you? Well, Nobel Prize is great, but as an engineer, I wanted to uncover the details of how they created this little source of blue light. And upon reading and understanding the details, I realized that bringing an LED so commonplace and affordable to life wasn't a stroll in the park. I mean, so many researchers fueled with keen attention and a spirit of exploration poured their efforts, literally poured their efforts into creating this tiny LED. And that's why I wanted to share this story with you. If you're interested in more details, then check the links that I've left in the description or in the comments below. If you have stuck around till now, then share one word or one line in the comments about how this blue LED story struck you. Did something change in your perspective? Will you look at this tiny source of blue light the same way? See you in the next one.